Welcome everyone. Thank you for coming today. We have a great set of alumni panelists here and they're about to share their experience and answer your questions on the topic of environmental law and policy. And as we go through this presentation, please feel free to type in your questions in the chat or use the raise hand feature. So we're gonna start get started by asking each of the alumni to give a brief description or an overview about their career path and their current goal. And then we'll open it up for questions from students. So we can get started. Um, Will, would you like to go first and introduce yourself and talk about an overview of your career path and career goals? Sure, that uh, sounds good. Nice to meet everybody. My name is Will Conley. I'm from Milwaukee and went to UW for undergrad. Although when I was there, I think we didn't have this program and just had to Google what jobs existed and were out there. So this is, is cool and happy to be a, a part of it. Um, and after that, I, I worked at Epic for a year, which some of you may be familiar with. It's a um, tech company in the healthcare space in Madison that employs a bunch of um, UW graduates, and then following that, went to law school also at UW, and then um, have since then, I think I graduated law school in 2019, uh, have been working for a firm that's based out of Seattle, but we have an office here in Madison, Perkins Coie, um, and I do a mix of litigation and transactional work, uh, but some of that litigation uh, is in the environmental space um, in a number of ways that I assume we'll probably uh, get into here, and then also on some voting rights litigation and some tech work with startups. So it's sort of a bit of a mix, um, but excited to get to meet everybody and, and hear from the other panelists. So thank you very much. Thanks, Will. Simo, would you like to go next? Sure, I'm happy to. Hi, everybody. I'm Sima Kakade. Um, and I also did my undergraduate degree at University of Wisconsin in Madison and love the campus, love the school. Um, I then went to law school as well and went to George Washington University in DC. Um, and from there, I have been a practicing lawyer in a law firm, uh, in the nonprofit space, as well as spent most of my career in, in legal practice in the federal government. I worked at two federal agencies in DC, both the US Department of Energy, uh, General Counsel's Office, and the US Environmental Protection Agency. Um, and about five years ago, I left uh, practicing law to teach law. Um, and I am an associate professor uh, of environmental law at the University of Maryland uh, School of Law, which is just outside the DC area. Um, and my uh, role at the University of Maryland is to teach students. So I teach students uh, in, a, in a class that allows students to actually work on real cases. We are a pro bono legal clinic is the class that I teach. And so students get uh, experience uh, writing documents and doing oral presentation and all the different kinds of skills that we learn in law school, they get to practice them in my class. So uh, that has been my career path. Kudos to everybody that is thinking about going into environmental law or policy. Um, when I went to law school and when I was graduating from University of Wisconsin, um, it, it, I was told, this was in the late 90s, that environmental law was not going to be a growing field and why not try something else and I'm so glad that I stuck with it. Um, it's a fantastic, fantastic profession with amazing work potential and really, really important issues of our time to work on. Thank you, Seema. Katie, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure thing. Hi, everyone. My name is Katie. Uh, I am also a UW-Madison grad. I also graduated in 2015 uh, from UW, and I took a few years off before going to law school. I worked in Chicago at the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals for three years uh, as, an appeal, uh, as a case administrator. So we helped manage the federal docket at the appellate level. So all the cases that come to the district court, the first lower level of courts, we would see those um, and make sure that the paperwork got processed accordingly and um, helped get the judges prepped accordingly for oral argument. 
And then after that, I moved back to California. I'm originally from Southern California, and I went to law school at University of California, Irvine. I just graduated in May, and I just took the California bar. So we'll cross our fingers and hope that went well. And I will be starting work at Paul Hastings in Orange County, which is a firm that's large, just like Perkins Coie. Um, we have offices everywhere too. And I will be working in litigation and employment, and that will have a focus on life, health science and environmental law. Thank you, Katie. So we'll get started with questions. Um, this is now open for any students to ask questions. You can put it in the chat or you can use the raise hand feature on here. So we can get started with that. I also have a list of questions that I wanna ask. So feel free to, to stop me at any point. So the first question, oh, we actually, um, Isabel, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, um, hi, um, thanks for being here today. My question that I have for all of you is just how you decided to go to law school versus going into any other um, graduate program or just staying with your undergraduate degree. I'm happy to give my experience. Um, I think it's a great question, Isabel. I struggled with that a lot. I did an economics major at UW with the, I think what was called the environmental studies certificate. Don't know if that is still the, the option at UW, but at the time you couldn't do a major or a minor in environmental studies. It was a certificate program and I did that and loved it. So I knew that I wanted to do something in the environmental field, um, but I was torn between graduate school in environmental economics or going to do something in public policy um, or going to do something in like a master's in government. I was kind of all over the place. Um, and to be honest, I took the GRE and the LSAT both and did better on the LSAT. Um, so that was part of it, uh, just practicality. The other part was that um, I had heard from several people that a lot of things uh, that you might want to do in the space of environmental law and policy, uh, you could do with a law degree, but not necessarily vice versa. Meaning, if you went into something that was more general, like public policy or economics, you couldn't be a lawyer. You had to actually go to law school for that. But there are a lot of people that go to law school uh, that want to do environmental work that end up doing policy and broad government work. Um, and so that is another reason why I chose uh, to go to law school, but it's a really interdisciplinary field. Um, so I think that I actually get a lot of students in my class in law school that come from a variety of backgrounds, um, people that had majors in chemical engineering and Spanish and all kinds of stuff. Um, and I think that it serves them well. And I don't think that you need to be of a certain mold to go to law school. A lot of students that I see also in law school are doing dual degree programs. Many of them are doing uh, JD PhDs, JD MBAs, um, many of them are. So I think there's a lot of law schools that don't make you choose either. So that's my response. I think, it, oh, Katie, you want to go? Oh, really? it doesn't matter to me. You can go ahead. I might still be thinking about mine, so you can, you can go. That, Isabel, it's a, it's a good question. So I, I grew up, my, my mother's a lawyer. So I grew up in a house that already had an attorney in it. And for me, the choice to go to law school, it was, it was a bit tenuous because I didn't just want to walk in her footsteps. I wanted to make sure I was doing something different and not just following in the footsteps of my parents. And so that's for me, it's why I took time off between undergraduate and law school. And I do think that for people who are interested in going to law school, sometimes that breathing room between going straight from undergrad right to law school and making that jump to getting any kind of master's program degree can be helpful because it's it's a chunk of change. Um, to do it and it gets it you end up in some debt whether you're in any kind of graduate program law school master's degree whatever and it's a pretty big life choice because you can choose to go on a certain career path that doesn't require an extra degree 
or you can jump into a bunch of different fields. So for me, I wanted to kind of test the waters and see if law was what was right for me. And I searched for jobs that were roughly in the field, but didn't require a law degree, which is how I ended up at the Seventh Circuit. And for me, working with the judges and the court staff for three years and seeing how that all worked from behind the scenes was really helpful in making sure that I was making the right decision in applying to law school and going to law school. So I think whether or not that answers your question right on the nose, I don't know. But I think one thing that's really helpful to think about in going to law school and applying is making sure you're making the right choice because you could be in SEMA's position and maybe you want to do a master's degree in environmental in environmental policy or something like that, or you might want to go to law school. So it's helpful to talk to people who are alums and figure out what they did and what might be right for you because this is your future and it's okay to ask those questions of people. You don't have to know exactly what you're going to do right when you leave UW. Yeah, I, I think that's great advice. Um, and one thing, I, I think it's interesting actually that Katie was able to get experience because I, I do know, I think law is a field that's sort of uniquely difficult to find out what it is that a lawyer does <laughs> like until you have a law degree. And and it's a common sort of issue that a lot of students have. And frankly, I, I've, my family are attorneys too. And not until my first few weeks of law school that I really understand what they did day to day. <laughs> Um, it, which I think is normal and, and that that's fine. And if you can get those opportunities, that's wonderful. But I think don't feel like if you can't find any, it's not a good path for you. Um, and similar to SEMA, I think my experience was that I, well, it's sort of a, a mix, but the one point that SEMA had about having taken both the, the GRE and the LSAT, I think I knew I was interested in law, but I wanted to kind of take time after undergrad, which I, I would certainly encourage um, doing if there's something else you'd want to pursue I think additional work experience can be good but um, so when I was knowing I was going to go work at Epic I took the LSAT prior to when I got there so I would sort of see how I did and see what my opportunities would be and the thing about law is there are a few steps like you can study for and take the LSAT see how you do and then apply to schools or take it again and apply to schools and maybe take it a third time if you want and there's no it's not like you're suddenly there and so you can always, it's sort of nice because you can slowly be evaluating your options. And for me, I, I took the LSAT, did pretty well, got into UW and it was a good opportunity and, and good time to go. And, and so I took the chance and, and went for it. So um, I think you can certainly not know if you're sure, but if you put in the work to take the LSAT and then sort of see what your opportunities are, it's always a good first step. Um, and beyond that, if you're still not sure and, you, and you'd and you like to just know more, I think all of you certainly like congratulations for even just being here, I like to have the initiative to show up to a panel and so on. Because I think if reach out to people and say, hey, do you like your job? I see you're an environmental attorney. Almost everybody's going to take that meeting and is happy to talk. I'm speaking for myself and I'm sure the other panelists would be happy if you have follow-up questions and, and so on. Um, and so just reaching out to attorneys and saying, can you tell me about your job and go to lunch and, and they'd be happy to do it. So I think if you can't get work experience, that's another good place to find out if you think law school might be a good fit. And the last point I'll say is law school and being an attorney are, are different. So if you talk to law students, they might tell you that they're not having a good time, but attorneys, I think generally um, are can be a bit happier. So that's my advice on that, I guess. Great question, Haley. Uh, thanks for answering that. Um, so what advice would you have for students who want to go into this field and what should students be doing to prepare themselves to be successful in the field? I could maybe start to speak to that one. I think um, generally for, what was the first part? The second is what to prepare to be successful. What was the first part? First was, what advice would you have for students who want to go into this field? I got it. Um, yes, to, to the first question, I think I, I would say generally, for, like, is everyone should pursue your interest and, and tell people what you're interested in and then show up. Like like I said, the fact that you're here, it's great. You're making connections and, and so on, and, and you're getting advice. And I think that's the first part. And then continue to do that. And if there's orgs, 
at UW, UW has a million organizations, which are wonderful. Um, I'm not as familiar with the environmental ones, but I'm sure there, there are plenty. And I think showing up to those events and, and meeting people is wonderful. And if people know we're interested in, they'll refer you to opportunities, especially like if you're looking at externships or internships and reaching out to organizations that do the types of things you're interested in. There's a whole ton of them in Wisconsin, I think, that that do environmental um, work that you may be interested in. And it really goes to whatever your interest is. But look for externships. I know that I assume there's ways you can even get credit and, and get paid potentially for being an extern at places to sort of get the experience. And those all build on each other so that what you and is what you can do to prepare because but if you get to law school, then, you know, most classes are kind of general. Some law schools, I think Colorado has a, a great environmental law specialty. Um, and and that is something that I work on the recruiting and hiring side as well of our of our newer associates. And I we definitely do look for, you know, if this person's in our EER, which is our environmental group, you know, they here they did a dual um, degree and they have this environmental or hard sciences background, or maybe they don't have a hard sciences background, but a dedicated track record of having worked in the space, which, um, you know, so maybe like my one good friend is an environmental attorney with us. He went on to get a master's in um, environmental science. And then, which I, I don't think is required necessarily. So I don't think if you don't do that, you don't need, you won't be an attorney in the space, but um, he did that. And then I think when he was applying to firms was able to show, you know, here's my dedicated interest in the background. So I, I don't think it needs to be that, and it can be whatever is unique to you and your interests. But if you continue to pursue the things you're interested in, they all show up on your resume. And I think that's a way to prepare yourself eventually for, for jobs in the space. You want to go next, Katie, or should I? You can feel free. Go right on ahead. OK, I guess my answer would be um, you know, that I think you should read. Um, I think that preparation for being successful, um, both in applying for any kind of graduate program that might be in environmental law and policy or wanting to work in the field in any capacity, um, either now or later, I, I think uh, a, a really key uh, to success that I don't think enough people entering the field or that are in the field do, including myself, is read. Um, I think reading is really just invaluable. I think you learn so much. It doesn't have to be literal reading. It could be audio articles, audio books, but um, keep learning. Um, there is so much in this space to try to understand. It's not one field. It's multiple different things. As I often say to people, it's like if you have a glass of water on your desk right now, it's like the water that's in the glass, it's how it got there, it's the glass around it and how that was made. I mean, it's literally everything. And so there's just so much um, to this field that reading about it and understanding it, I think naturally piques your curiosity. It naturally helps you understand things that you can then speak about in interviews or you can write about in personal essays. Um, or that you can converse about with experts if you're showing up at webinars, um, or that you can network uh, about when you're going to conferences or meet and greets um, or happy hours. Um, and so I would say, if nothing else, even when you're home during a pandemic or any other time, uh, read. And if you like what you're reading um, and you're interested in it and drives you to read more about it, I think that's a really good sign. I mean, I, I echo both what Will and Seema have just said. I think, I mean, I, I am still registered to a bunch of different newsletters to this day that I try to read. If I don't get to it during the week, I try to catch up on them on the, with it on the weekends that are, you know, snippets of what's happening in the federal circuits just to see what's going on with the law and how it's changing, whether that's environmental law specific or employment specific or something broader. It's just good to stay up on what's going on. It's not necessarily helping you in your day to day, but it's, you know, points that you can kind of file away in the back of your head. And the next time you end up in a room with someone and something comes up, you can be right at the forefront of the conversation. And it's just because you were keeping up with what's going on 
Um, I would recommend just generally reading the news. I'm not going to plug like one news outlet or another, but staying up to date on the news and what's going on in the world, I think is really important. And I know that kind of dovetails with reading, but I think part of being a lawyer is being aware of your surroundings and not just staying pigeonholed and kind of, you know, people always joke, oh, aren't you always stuck in your office and stuck with your nose in a book or stuck with your nose in a, in a draft of something? Yeah, you are always working, but you have to be aware of what's going on or you can't do your job very well. Um, so there is a very active part of this job, whether you are a law student or your professor or your practicing attorney that work, requires you to be aware of your surroundings. So, you know, for everything, for all of the, you know, ragging on what an attorney, being an attorney might be, know that you do have to be aware of your surroundings and you aren't just going to sit and push papers around. Thank you for answering that. Um, as a reminder, students, that we'd love to have you ask your questions, either on the mic or in the chat. Just raise your hand. Um, Azura, would you would you like to ask your question? Yeah, hi. Um, sorry if there's an echo, but um, I had a question. So I'm like, I know, I don't want to butcher your name, Seema. So sorry if I butchered that. But um, I know you briefly mentioned that you have students who weren't even in any field related to law. I currently am studying plant biology and film, which is like not even near law at all. But are there any characteristics from students or any like anything that can apply to going into law school, even if your undergrad majors are completely not related or even close to law? If anyone could touch upon that. That would be awesome. Yeah, Azura, it's a great question. Um, and I would say that your fields in particular that you're studying are both very relevant, I think. Um, I think, like I said before, I think environmental law and policy is related to so many fields because it's not a narrow discipline. It's really, really wide, right? So plant biology, perfect. It's a, it's a science field that can connect to many aspects of environmental law, particularly in the natural resource context, particularly with respect to a habitat, um, wildlife issues, endangered species issues, right? Natural resource protection, coastal ecosystems, watershed ecosystems. I mean, there's many, many disciplines of regulation, of policy, of trying to manage resources, of property law that all have to deal with natural resources. And so plant biology is very applicable uh, to many disciplines in the environmental law context in particular. Um, I also see a lot of people with biology-based degrees that come to law school and get interested in other areas that are not environmental, but that also have a decent connection uh, to science. Um, and particularly biology. I have students that become interested in health law because that's a pretty foundational aspect is biology to how our health system works and how our bodies work. Um, also intellectual property and patent law is also a really common field for students that have experience at the undergrad level in biology. Uh, with respect to film, um, I see a lot of students that come with arts degrees in, gen in a wide range that are actually really good at evidence and really good at evidence law because they're really thinking about how to communicate and portray uh, pieces of information um, in court cases um, and not even just court cases in all kinds of different types of testimony. Um, I had students last year that testified in the Maryland State Legislature and used all kinds of phenomenal diagrams and photos and really put together a very creative presentation. And several of those students actually had fine arts undergrad degrees um, and I think did a phenomenal job and were, were great advocates, which is a huge amount of environmental law and policies learning how to advocate and how to convince. Um, and we do that through art forms as well. So I, I absolutely think that there's multiple disciplines um, that are not related directly to a traditional notion of law that are very applicable in the environmental law context or in the advocacy context, broadly speaking, and your areas in particular, I think have a lot of potential. Yeah, I would say, and especially at UW because there isn't a pre-law um, major and there's no reason to feel like you're you're behind the the curve or something if other people I don't think there is a major that's specifically better 
or worse for law. And in fact, I think all of them are, are good for it. And by the time you graduate law school, it isn't always super relevant what your undergrad was just because there will be a lot of um, other things going on and ways you can specialize. But um, it, one interesting point, Judge Peterson, who's one of the federal judges in the Western District of Wisconsin, he um, got a PhD and then actually was teaching film at Notre Dame. So maybe there is something specific about film that, that is more useful. So that could be a good one. I think the only exception is maybe engineering is if, if you're going into patent prosecution, which is like writing and filing patents and so on, some um, engineering can be useful, but there's a whole gamut and whatever you study I think is good. I will plug because I have a bias for the philosophy department at UW, but I think that if, if you're looking for a class that I'll take that I can guarantee will be useful any writing class, but specifically for any of the philosophy classes, because they, the way that you have to write papers in philosophy and probably a lot of other liberal arts classes are sort of how you brief things as an attorney where here's my argument, here's the three reasons connected by various logic as to why, and that's my conclusion. And, and I think the philosophy department at UW does a particularly good job of helping students curate that writing style. So um, even if you don't major in it, definitely worth taking a class or two. Yeah, if we're gonna talk about classes at UW. So I mean, I was a legal studies and poli sci double major. So I guess that kind of just has it written all over it that I was gonna maybe go to law school someday. But there are a couple of professors within the legal studies department that also teach within the UW law school. And if you can find those classes as an undergrad and if they're open to you, absolutely take it. And one of my favorite professors was um, Mitra Sharafi. You know, she's still teaching at the law school and she's still teaching as an undergrad, undergrad classes, like absolutely take a class with her. I took both of the classes that she offered to undergrads and they're both great. And she will grade you and kind of curate your writing to be like what you, something that you would produce in law school. So that was great. But my, my two cents on this is it doesn't matter what major you are. I know that the, my double major looked like I was going to go to law school, but I spent my last year of law school as the student representative on the admissions committee. And so I worked with nine or 10 faculty members as the singular uh, third year law student on the committee reading all of the applicants files for the class of 2024. Um, it was really interesting. It's from people, you know, all over the country. And we would read their admissions essays and we would read their diversity statements and we would look at their transcripts and we would see, you know, where they were from and why they might fit at UC Irvine. And I can tell you that no majors overlapped. There is no one major that, you know, rose to the top of, oh, UC Irvine took old, like, you know, 70% English majors. Not the case. It was all over the map, people from all walks of life all over the country, didn't matter what age you were, didn't matter when you went to school, you could have taken long gap, short gap, whatever. Um, it really matters for purposes of going to law school that you take the LSAT and that you put together a great package that explains why you would be a good fit for the law school. And that's not necessarily the same thing at every law school. So you get to do the research on why schools out in California are different than schools on the East Coast or why schools in the Pacific Northwest are different than schools in Florida. And you kind of get to figure that out, but your major is no, it should never stop you from having interest in going to law school. You can go to any law school in the country. Um, it's just gonna be a matter of how you put the application together and demonstrate to the law school that you're applying to that you'd be an awesome fit. Awesome, I have a question. Um, how did the process go of deciding what kind of law you wanted to study and how early did you have to make that decision? I can, I can take that one first. Um, so many students don't know at all uh, when they enter law school. Many students don't know in their first year or their second year or their third year. Um, and I teach mostly second and third year students and uh, work with students all the time who are really worried about picking a particular subject matter or a discipline. 
Um, but what law school tries to do is teach you, right, how to conceive of the law, broadly speaking. So we're thinking about it in terms of things like skills, like critical reading and writing. And we're also thinking about foundations of our legal system on things like criminal law, right? You might think you want to do environmental law, but you're not sure. And you actually realize that a lot of our environmental laws have a criminal component to them. And so criminal law actually connects to environmental law when some students don't realize that, right? Some students also get there and they go, I didn't know that property law, which is a first year required course in most law schools, also connects to environmental law because it's about how we lose our, use our land, right? And it's about who owns land and it's about who can lease land. And that comes up in the context of natural resource law a lot. And so we don't try to, most law schools don't try to say, you've got to pick, you've got to pick. Students can, and a lot of law schools offer certificate programs and tracks and things like that, which means you might take uh, more courses in a particular discipline. Um, but most of the time, everyone's taking the same first year courses and those are foundations. And then you can take some seminars in your second and third year. And I talked to many alum uh, from University of Maryland Law School who are five, 10, 15, 20 years out like myself who change their discipline well after they've graduated too. Uh, yeah, I would say I'm working on still figuring out what area of law they, they would like to practice. I think that's perfectly normal. And, and I think uh, most law schools do give you um, by requirement, just as, as Seema said, a, a general broad overview. And then it's sort of then once you begin to understand what the law is and, and how it works that you can begin to apply it. I think the real time period to begin to delve into that. So like you don't even need to really have a particular concern until this time is in the summers in law school, because you can reach out to organizations and law firms and say, hey, I'm interested in this practice and that practice. Um, so I think to the extent you have an interest and idea, that's great. And it's it's can be helpful when you get to law school for maybe some classes, but otherwise just sort of the organizations you want to join. And and um, if you aren't quite sure, I would say that's more than, than typical. So um, for me personally, I think I didn't have a, a, I think I was interested in emerging tech sort of, and, and I ended up doing environmental work because the firm I went to does a lot of it out of our Madison office, which is great. And so I do some of that and some of the tech work, which, which I really enjoy. Um, and so sometimes the opportunities find you as well and showing up and when you're, when you're interested and, and being available. So, but either way, I think is great. Again, by, I echo both what, what Seema and Will have said here. Um, I, I know that there's other people that have to ask, that want to ask questions, so I don't want to fill up the time too much and just repeat what they say in, in different words. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, of course. Thank you for answering that. Uh, I have another question. So what is the profile of someone who is successful in starting out in this field? Okay, I will jump in on that, and I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna come at it now that now the two people that are left in this chat are um, we don't have the same clout that um, Professor Kakade had, so we'll we'll see what we can do to answer the question but i think in general whether you're starting out in the environmental field or you're just starting out as a new lawyer i think one thing you need is a little bit of grit and a little bit of tenacity and that's something that you kind of need throughout law school you're going to be pushed down and you're going to feel not great a lot of the time because going to law school is hard and being an attorney is hard um, this isn't an easy job and it requires a lot of time and a lot of effort and it requires a lot of like self-will and determination. And that is usually found when you're an undergrad, depending on what your major is and depending on how you've been brought up, you know, all walks of life, you go through things personally and you come out of it better on the other end because you've learned some type of lesson and you've grown from it. All those things help build you into the attorney that you're going to be. And so if you can apply your own life lessons to the law, 
and continue to be compassionate, continue to be thoughtful, and continue to be kind and think about how your actions are going to affect your client or the party on the other side that you might be dealing with. That's one of the ways that for me, I have felt successful is like, you know, you come to a good place when you feel good about the outcome and you know that your opposition also feels good about the outcome. Um, you're not trying to duke it out in like a bloody fight to get to the end. Ideally, you want to use your own like goodwill to make friends with the other side and I don't know, be thoughtful. <laughs> you know, lawyers can kind of be built up as these like menacing, rude, disrespectful people. And that's not really the case. The, the way to be a good lawyer and to be successful in the field is to be thoughtful to those around you and to make sure that you can come to an amicable solution. And that's true on the environmental side. And that's true in all sorts of areas of the practice as well. You're not trying to you're never going to win an argument just by beating the other side down. You kind of have to whittle your way through, like down the path to get to a good, a good place for both sides. I don't know how Will feels about that, but that would be my two cents for success. No, I think that's definitely true. I, I think the other two points that are very important are writing is that you can't really be a lawyer if you don't like writing. I also think in undergrad, people get an unusual view, like, cause you know, my friends who I know enjoy reading articles and stuff, they're like, oh, I just hate reading and writing. And it's like, yeah, but you, you're on your phone reading all these articles about whatever the topic is you're interested. So I think don't discount yourself if you don't think you've traditionally academically been a reader, writer, but you need to, to be able to do that very clearly and succinctly. Um, that's why I think those philosophy classes are good. It's the main work product. It's what we spend most of our day doing. I think last year I, I probably produced 50,000 pages of Word documents. So it's just like, it's what you end up doing. And then I, I think, so that's the skill you might need, but it's certainly one you learn. You can continue to learn. You'll learn in law school. Every You're all capable of it. But um, the other thing is, I think, being an attorney is a client services business. So my schedule is basically dependent on what my client's problems are. And I don't get to choose when they have problems. And it's, it's something you need to kind of be comfortable with. I think most attorneys, that's kind of the case um, with the exception of maybe if some in-house roles or maybe some governmental roles, but typically um, for the type of work Katie and I do, it's, you sort of have to be okay with it's fun because you get to work on these cutting edge issues and problems and solve them and be an advocate, but you're sort of, it's not the typical like nine to five, you're in, you're out and you're not thinking about it. So I think you need to be comfortable with that. And that's a, something you can learn over time. If you do apply to other jobs before going to law school, if you look at like consulting roles, that's very similar. Epic is sort of one. Um, if you look in, in Madison, that does that. And, and any type of client services, job, I think would give you good exposure to that. Um, and the other thing I would say is if you're like a senior and you're thinking, you know, maybe I'll take the LSAT, but I have applied other places. If you get somewhere and you really like what you're doing, by all means do that. There's, you don't have to go be an attorney if you really like what you're doing. I think um, it, it, that's an important thing people sometimes forget. And, and it is, law school is not easy and being an attorney can be difficult. And so, and you know, there's the debt, which is a huge thing. And that's why like my most practical advice, this is a little off topic, but take the LSAT as many times as you need to because there's no rush and there's a significant amount of money you can make to go to school for free if you do just a few points better and that can be a huge difference. Um, so definitely like take your time and consider your options. And if you find something you're enjoying and you feel fulfilled, like do that and you know, you can always go back and be an attorney later. There's plenty of, um, I think the average age of matriculation at UW is like 28 or 29. I think that's typical for most law schools. So there's no rush and, and take your time. Thank you. Um, I have another question. So what are projects or um, work that you're currently working on I asked this and I realized that maybe there's things that you aren't able to share, but what are projects that you're working on that you're passionate about um, in this environmental law field? 
I mean, I'll quickly say what I can say and then I'll be done. But I think that depending on where you live and where you work, environmental work is different. Um, it kind of depends on what region of the country you work in. So what um, Professor Kakade did, she worked in the government for a while and she said she worked at the Department of Energy and another and another governmental agency. And so she was working for the federal government at, with all different kinds of environmental law. If you work in California, you work on a lot of water quality issues. Um, you live, you know, most of the state borders the Pacific Ocean, and there's a lot of issues with the drought and how the reservoirs work and how the aqueducts work in the middle of the state. And so a lot of the litigation surrounding environmental law here deals with if the water is dirty and how we can make sure the water is clean and who it who the water ends up servicing within the state. And so it is quite regional. If you go look at environmental law state by state, you will see it usually tracks like what's going on in the news and how, how that state is dealing with climate issues. So that will be my quick plug on that. Um, yeah, I would say consistently, I, I, do, I do some corporate work and one of my companies is a company out of Texas that's, it's sort of in the weeds, but wholesale energy retailer for clean energy. So if you want to buy like um, credits of, of renewable energy, they'll sell them to um, other institutions. And so it's, I support them in a way sort of like helping them run their corporate governance and, and raising money and so on. And, and that's cool to do. And, and I think they have an interesting product. Um, separately, recently, we've, we've done a lot of work about um, the Sauk Prairie Conservancy and, and the rights for its use, which Katie may be familiar with from the Seventh Circuit as we've spent some time there. Um, and effectively, it's sort of, you know, when, when oh, actually, I have another one I, that just came up. In the Apostle Islands, if anybody's been there, um, I've been working with an attorney out of our DC office to create a conservancy of some private land up in the Apostle Islands, um, which is very cool. And like, I ended up going there a few weeks ago for work, which is sort of a, a crazy and random place to go as a um, attorney on a work project. And it, we were originally gonna be hosting a Russian delegation who is viewing the conservancy to learn how they do it. And then the weather was bad and so they couldn't arrive. But it was an unusual thing to tell people like, oh, I can't actually meet you on Monday because I'm hosting a Russian delegate to the Apostle Island. So I, it's an interesting thing about laws. You just like really never know where it takes you. And it, it can be an exciting field to work on because um, just, yeah, it was crazy and random projects will, will, will pop up. So um, lots of excitement. Thank you for answering that. Students, again, if you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand, jump in. Um, but in the meantime, I'm going to ask another question. So uh, what have been your most important considerations when choosing this job? Um, how did you find your job? Uh, what was the networking process like? So at most law schools around the country, um, when you finish your first year of law school, your the first thing you do after your first year is you find an internship or an externship. And that internship or externship is typically not paid. And it the way it ends up working is it doesn't really matter what you choose to do. Your career office at your law school is going to help you find a job. And it could be in the state that you go to law school in, or it could be in your home state if you're not from there. But either way, the point is to have something on your resume that says you worked after your first year of law school. And hindsight 2020 says one of the best parts about that job for a lot of people is it either tells you what you really like or it tells you what you really don't like. Some people take that job for 10 weeks and they find out I don't like criminal law and they kind of like knock that off of their list of things they might want to do. And so part of this search, you know, if I go back to 30,000 feet with all of you for a second is you'll go through law school or you'll go through, you know, anything post-grad from college and you'll figure out what you like, but you also will figure out what you don't like. 
which I think is which I think is just as helpful as figuring out what you do like to do. Both of those lists are important. Anyway, you have you take that job and then right before you start your 2L, your second year of law school, there's usually something called on campus interview week or early interview week, where if you're interested in working at a firm, and both Will and I work at relatively large international law firms, you go through this pretty extensive interview process with the firms that again is managed by your career services office at your law school and so you're sending in resumes you're sending in cover letters and such and it's all it's all process that's managed through your law school and i would say that most of your law school classmates all go through the process um they do because it's not because they have to or they're told to, but it's a good opportunity to try to get a job at a firm um, without having to go through the process through the firm's website. These employers come to your school or near your school and they will have set interview time slots where they will interview you along with like 15 or 20 of your classmates over the course of the day. Um, in California, the employers come out to all the different law schools for like a week or two and do this like up and down the state and your law school will have like a four day long process where 20 30 40 50 firms come over a period of a few days and whoever ended up picking your resume out of the pile will interview you so i think when i did it i had like seven or eight interviews and they're quick and you kind of just rip through them and then the firm will call you back for a callback and you will actually go to the office and have a more extensive interview rather than just a quick one with one person and at that point they may or may not give you an offer and so i know that whole process that's like that was a huge whirlwind but that takes about a month two months and it's a really busy time. It's like the beginning of your second year of law school. You're trying to figure out what you want to do. But the whole process of finding a job at a firm usually comes in that window of time. And if you choose not to work at a firm, generally speaking, you're working with your career services office and using the job listings that the career services office at your law school has put up for you. Almost all career service offices at law schools are like their goal is to make sure you're employed when you leave law school. That is their number one priority. And the better they can have their employment numbers, like the better off the law school is. So law schools don't like when their employment numbers dip, you know, below 90%. They wanna keep, they wanna make sure everybody's employed when they leave. And so your best bud until you have a job at, you, at law school is the career services office because they really wanna make sure that you're employed, but you're not just employed, you're employed at a job that you want to be at. And so a lot of people end up on that firm route. And if they don't, you're talking to somebody in the office. Maybe you want to do public interest. Maybe you really want to go work in the government. Maybe you know you want to be a public defender. You know, all the above. You're talking to them. So, Will, you can say how you got your job, but I'm going to hedge my bets and say it was through something like that. Yeah, you're spot on. It was OCI. <laughs> Yeah. There, but the only thing I would add is is to think regionally when you're thinking about what school, because if once you take the LSA, you'll be looking at schools. If you think you want to end up staying in Wisconsin, I think Wisconsin is probably the best school you can go to. It's cost effective. A lot of the attorneys in Wisconsin went here. You don't have to pass the bar, which is a separate thing. Um, like if, if you're going to be an attorney in Wisconsin, go to Wisconsin. Um, if you want to go to the West Coast, like California, I thought about going to the Bay Area. So I was looking at going to, to Berkeley is like I probably does well in, in that area. And same, uh, there's probably s s schools in Southern California and same with any other state. If you're from New York or Georgia or something, regionally, those schools will have will pipeline more jobs to those regions. And it's harder to do cross country. Like it, it was harder for me to get connections in California at Wisconsin. And that'll be the case. So just um, it's something to keep in mind is where you think you'll want to practice, keep an eye towards those schools. It's not impossible. It's just you'll have to do more legwork. Yeah, I would. I totally agree with Will. And I would say that now living again on the West Coast, we had people go all over the country. It is it is a little bit of luck, um, but 
if you look at employment numbers from California law schools, you'll see most people stay within the state. So I know it's a bit of a projection forward to think, oh, what am I going to do in three years after law school? Where am I going to live? You have to do a little bit of legwork and a little bit of personal reflection to know like, okay, if I want to live in Texas for the rest of my life, then maybe going to school somewhere in the South or the Southeast is a good idea because I'll be near Texas and that is a very large job market. And so I'm going to end up living there and taking that bar exam because where you take the bar exam is where you will be allowed to practice law. So. Well, are you saying something? I don't think we can, <laughs> can hear you. I was afraid of that all then. I uh, thank you. So I was going to grab this question about day to day responsibilities and as an environmental lawyer um, and how they compare. So one distinction is there's transaction and litigation. And so litigation, you go to um, court and you have lawsuits. And so, for instance, you could be suing, depending on who you're representing, you could be suing an energy company. You could be the energy company suing the government or you could be um, representing a, a group, uh, an environmental group with bringing a lawsuit against, you know, the government for how they're using land or something. And if you're doing that type of litigation day to day, you are involved in those cases. So you're, you're writing a lot of briefs, which is you're asking the court to do something, um, or you are going to court and making arguments. And then when you're not doing that, you're sort of interviewing clients and working with clients. And on the transactional side, you could be a lot of the environmental transactional work we do is representing, you know, energy companies. And, you know, if you're um, in, in regulatory work, so you're representing those companies before government entities, or maybe you're making filings for permits and so on. So the day-to-day -day for that might include like you go, get to work and you're um, for instance, I, I filed a permit in Iowa to be a natural gas processor or something. And so it, it was, here's all the facts about the company. Here's what we intend to do with the natural gas. Can we get a permit under these statutes? Um, so I would say it's sort of a mix. That's generally the same as other areas of law in litigation and in corporate, um, whereas some go to court more often. Like if you're a criminal attorney, you're in court almost every day. Whereas if you're sort of a business attorney, you tend to mostly be at, at your office. And everything is remote now, so that we'll see how long that lasts. Yeah, there's nothing much more to add. So, um, I guess one last question that I do have, we do have about three or four minutes, um, but what is one step or action that students can take today to start or continue their journey in environmental law and policy? That's a good question. I, I think doing what you're doing, reaching out, knowing what you're interested in, reaching out to people and saying, hey, this is what I'm interested in, you know, can I observe or can I help out? You'll be amazed at how many people reach back out and are like, hey, we know you're interested in this. Would you want to plug into this opportunity? So if you're just, you know, spend time seeing in your communities who is doing something that you think is interesting with that interest and reach out and call. Like I said, I'm not sure any attorney I've ever met has turned down an, an email that's just like, hey, can I hear about your practice? Can we go to lunch? Can we go to coffee? Apart from the law, I think that's a super normal networking message to send. I think it's something um, Michael probably encourages. So definitely reach out to anybody who's doing something interested in and just tell them, hey, I would like to learn more about what you're doing. Do you have any opportunities for me? Um, and you'll be amazed where that ends you, gets you, gets you through. Yeah, I echo the same thing. And one way you can do it is I know on LinkedIn, you can kind of look at, you You can kind of curate your search based on where you are. So you can go look at UW and you can see who was a UW alumni and you can see where they ended up working. So, you know, use the tools on the internet to kind of help you get to those places. And you can add somebody on LinkedIn and message them there. Um, if you see people are in a state that you might want to end up in, 
ask them those questions too. And I think that's okay. And finding, um, I know for me, for networking purposes, finding like one thing that I might have in common with the person I know I want to talk to is usually a really helpful starting point in a conversation because instead of shooting in the dark, you've chosen to seek out a person that may or may not have a common interest with you. And so a great way to do that because we're all badgers here is to say, hey, I'm a current student at UW, I'm a recent grad at UW, and I see you went there and I'm really interested in hearing about this. And usually that kind of like personal touch you can put on it is helpful in getting even farther in a conversation because the person doesn't just think that you've like found them on the internet randomly, you, that you are, you know, a known quantity and value to them. And so that's super cool. And usually like at UW, you know, everybody wants to help a lot. I mean, that's why we're here. We wanted to do this program today because um, you guys are all in school and we went there. And if this was available when we were in school, I'm sure I would have been in the Zoom room listening to the same thing from somebody else, you know, six, eight, 10 years ago. So this is exactly how you do it. So you're already doing it. Like you're making the right choice and you're, you're taking the step in the right direction. And those meetings go a really long way. Like you're going to gain experience hearing how they talk and what they talk about. And it's like when I interview law students now, and I'm sure it's the same if you're interviewing pre-law students for other jobs. Like if you're interviewing somebody and they're like, yeah, I talked to this attorney, this attorney, and that attorney, your firm, here's why I'm interested. Isn't this issue interesting? Blah, 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 blah. Like you're going to stand out in the interview as somebody who's demonstrated interest in the field. And, and it's certainly going to make a difference. So um, it's not like, it's totally not going to be wasted time to learn um, from people and to reach out. And honestly, I still send emails like that to people in my firm. Like I emailed a guy last week saying, hey, I, I'm in the Madison office. I'm interested in your work. Like I, this guy went to UW. So it, it never ends, but it's a good step to, to get you familiar with doing. Great, thank you so much. Thank you alumni for being here and thank you students for participating. Uh, we'll end the session now. Thank you again. Have a great evening.